thanks to Steve and MenuWorks for hosting, as usual. They're awesome, and this place is awesome. Uh, so I'm Brian Sampson. Uh, this is Rails for Mobile APIs. And this is a real request that I ran against my Rails server earlier today. So we're getting slash beers.json, and it was 200 OK. So hopefully we'll talk about that a little bit more in depth. So just a little bit about me and some uh, shameless shout outs. Uh, Samson ASU on Twitter. I like Twitter. I tweet a lot about a wide range of things. You should follow me, or if you want to get a hold of me, that's probably the best place. Or uh, email address is pretty good. I founded 10 Forward Consulting. It's a rail shop. We've been in Madison for a year. When I moved here, I started the company and started hiring people. And uh, if you're looking for a job, come talk to me, because we're kind of always hiring if it's a good fit. Uh, the topic of, or the, the kind of the website driving the talk today is called festbuddy.com. Uh, it's a startup that me and two other guys are doing here in town. And it's, it's basically beer fest management. And so we have a whole, we have apps, we have a management suite that's online. We have a mobile responsive site, and it's all driven by Rails um, through a, a bunch of APIs that we'll talk about later. Um, cloud 5 app is another project that our company is launching. It's HTML5 builds for the cloud, uh, kind of like PhoneGap, but a lot better. So if that's something you're interested in, check it out. Day-to-day, um, <clears throat> -day, I work out of MadWorks Coworking, which is on the west side and moving. It's in Middleton right now, and we're moving, uh, partnering with the University Research Park off of Mineral Point at like Whitney Way. And we're moving there, and it's going to be a whole big relaunch and everything in September. And we're all really excited about it. Hopefully, we're going to be doing really cool stuff, getting some startups and getting some more community involvement uh, for people who are not privileged enough to live downtown and have exposure to all of the wonderful co-working opportunities that are downtown. And then finally, I thought for sure this would not be the first plug of Madison Ruby, but Madison Ruby is coming up in a couple weeks. I'm not speaking there or anything. It's just one of the country's Woo. best Ruby conferences. And I was there last year. It's amazing. VenueWorks plays a huge part in throwing the conference, and I hope that everyone, I assume everyone already has their tickets, so I don't even really need to bring it up, but I thought I would just in case. All right, so you hear people talking about you have an API, or your website needs an API, or everybody's got an API. And so I want to talk just briefly about what that means. Um, so obviously, application programming interface, something like that, all programming languages have an API. Uh, lots of websites have an API. When you talk to Facebook, you use their, web, their API. When you talk to Twitter or a lot of these other libraries and everything, they use an API. But when we're talking about it in the context of Rails, it has a few kind of specific meanings. Um, so usually we're talking about a REST API, not something like a SOAP API or even a native, like a C bindings API or something like an API for your Ruby gem, something like that. We're usually talking about HTTP based. REST, which fun enough stands for Representational State Transfer, which is something that no one needs to know. <laughs> uh, important things about REST, how many people are familiar with using REST APIs? Almost everyone, that's good. How many people have written REST APIs? Okay, good, almost everyone. Anyone who's written Rails recently should have written a REST API whether you knew it or not. Because Rails, since about halfway through version two, they started doing it, and then they've really been pushing kind of this RESTful, resourceful-based routing and application design and architecture, and it's, uh, it's really good. So uh, usually when people ask if you have an API nowadays in the context of Rails, they're talking about JSON-based APIs, too, although you could communicate in whatever you wanted. Uh, and an important part of the REST, the REST API is that it's resource-based. So basically, you're, you're exposing some object model, some subset or superset or something of your internal object model, and then you perform basic CRUD operations on it, get, list, uh, update, delete, create, things like that. So that's kind of the REST API in a nutshell, and I'm hoping that most people are familiar enough with that that we don't have to spend a whole ton of time on it. So um, why have an API? So even if you're not, even if your API isn't public, uh, this is what I was talking about with Rails architecture um, over the past few years, has been focusing more and more on this resourceful-based, RESTful-based API. And it's really good even if your only site is your Rails site and you have no secondary clients or anything. 
because it helps you think about from the get-go that you want to decouple your client and your server relationships. And so in an MVC pattern, it sometimes can blur the lines between where your functionality goes, but when you, when you focus on these resourceful routes and these resourceful kind of API-based contracts, it really helps you clarify that stuff ahead of time. And then as soon as you need to add a second client that is not HTTP or HTML, as soon as you need to support a mobile app, or as soon as someone wants to pull a data feed out of your site, it's already kind of set up if you're doing this kind of thing. So supporting many clients is obviously a good reason to have an API rather than having to write the interface that your iPhone app uses to talk to your server and be different than the Android app, and be different than the, the, your rich app, and be different than your website. Um, the API formalizes kind of the contracts about how you talk to your objects, how you create them, how you delete them, what properties they have, that type of thing, and uh, it makes supporting multiple clients a lot easier. REST APIs in particular, uh, as I mentioned, are stateless, which means they do not rely on like a, a session, right? So oftentimes you will use a session for authentication, although oftentimes you won't, and we'll talk about that later. Um, but stateless requests make scaling easier. If you don't have any state in your request, and you can just say, hey, get me beer number five, then the client doesn't really care which server. And so once you have 100 million users all at the same time, you can just spin up extra servers and then any one of them can tell you what beer number five's properties are. And any number of one of them can insert beer number six into your database. And you don't need to worry about all of this stateful kind of session-based stuff. Uh, that introduces a couple other problems, but we're not gonna talk, into, talk about that. Um, also, it's easier to support deep linking. If your whole kind of app is designed around these resources, then when you want information about beer number six, you can just go to slash beer slash six HTML, and then that can be the HTML representation of whatever that object is. And so it makes kind of handling your page views and your URLs, it makes them make a lot more sense than just kind of clicking through randomly and posting to pages and things like that. And so there's a number of really good reasons to use this type of architecture pattern, even if you're not supporting multiple devices, and even if you're not making a public API, and even if you're not you don't have an iPhone app or any of that thing. This is a really good thing. And it's it's kind of, it's basically the standard way that Rails works now anyway. So, which is why probably a lot of you have experience with it. Um, so Rails makes it easy, obviously. Um, if you generate a scaffold controller in Rails, um, and then you add this resources, whatever route, uh, they, they add a whole ton of your RESTful routes. And, uh, I'm gonna break into a little bit of code here. I'm gonna be back and forth from code to uh, whatever here, if I can figure out how to use this thing. So, um, let's make that a little bit bigger. Everybody see that? Bigger? Mm -hmm. So this is a command that probably, how many of you have ran this command before? Okay, about half, a little over half. Uh, so this is like the Rails do it all for me command, right? They create, um, well, not quite all, but there's one more that you can do, do a little bit more. But this creates your controller. It creates a bunch of HTML views, which aren't really useful for us here. It creates your specs, of course. And the routes that it creates are, these are your RESTful routes, right? So slash beers, a get, we'll list them. The post, will create one. And then new isn't really used in like a JSON API and edit. These are HTML views. Um, get an individual beer. Uh, post a put a um, an update to a single instance, and of course delete. And so uh, these are HTTP verbs. I think everybody's familiar, hopefully, with HTTP verbs. And so that's what's kind of cool about this. URL format is you can use the same URLs, right? So like slash beers.json, depending on if you're posting a form to it or if you're just issuing a GET request, that same URL does different things. And so the URLs are basically a representation of our resources. And this is a fundamental thing that keeps kind of coming back. And then I wanted to look just a little bit at what Rails gives us. So this is just a vanilla scaffold controller. We don't actually have a beers controller, although we do have beers in our database here. Um, and so it does a lot of this stuff for you. 
And one of the things that I don't like that it does for you is this guy right here. And so I think we're going to talk about that next. But this has certain implications. When you just say render JSON, that's telling Rails you want to render JSON, and then you just pass it all of the beers, which it does some magic, and then it returns a bunch of JSON that kind of it came up with from magic. It's basically all of the attributes that are, I don't know if it's all the public attributes or the accessible attributes, or it might just be all the attributes. Um, but this can cause some problems when you, once you actually start using your API and you need to deliver different sets or if you need to deliver like object graphs, uh, it can start to cause real problems. And so we'll talk about a better way to do that in a second. So, JSON. So why use JSON? Um, has anybody anybody ever used SOAP? Boom. So you guys know why you, you guys know why we use JSON. Uh, anybody who's ever had to read and edit XML for any period of time knows why we use JSON. Um, it's super easy and convenient. Um, you can eval it and it turns into JavaScript objects. Uh, you shouldn't ever do that, but you can if you want to. Um, and then Rails has a number of, a couple different ways to generate JSON, to basically turn your Rails objects into their JSON representations. And so uh, that code that I just showed, where you say render JSON at beers, that calls uh, to JSON under the hood, which is defined on active record and maybe more things, probably more things, uh, but active record uh, in particular, maybe active model. And that calls as JSON underneath the hood. And I'm going to show you some examples of this. So if you don't like if you don't like the default, which is to just include all the attributes, uh, you're free and encouraged to override as JSON in the model. And so this is stripped from a different project of mine where uh, we started going down this road for various reasons because it's it's easier and faster than introducing other dependencies and things like that. And so basically these as JSON it takes this options hash, which can have a bunch of optional, pretty standard kind of Rails-y type things. So you can say options methods and options include. And options methods will simply do what it sounds like. It invokes a method and then includes that. And so we have, uh, this came from like a user object it's on the job site. And so profile photo URL is, a, is not an attribute. That's the thing that's generated, and so it's not in the database. And so we wanted to include that in the JSON representation because it's useful. And so you can override this and say, and you want to make sure not to clobber the other methods that are in here. Because if someone had passed in methods, options, you don't want to clobber that, which is why we, or equals. And so we say, yeah, OK, we have occupation display and job group display and some of these other methods. And then the include key. Uh, will reference um, like relationships. So this is from like a job profile or something object. And so we also want to include that user object. And then it has this complicated hash where we say we want only the first name and last name and email. We don't want to include, for example, encrypted password or updated at or last login IP or a bunch of things that are on the user record that we don't want included in every JSON reply that serializes like this. And then similarly, on the object that we're here, so this uses uh, Paperclip, which is an awesome gem for managing, uploading files and storing them in random places, S3 or database or file system or whatever. But it annotates with a whole bunch of other common names, like file name, updated at, file size, content type, a bunch of stuff that we don't want included in here. And so it probably would be better here if this was an only, using the accepts can burn you, because later on down the road, you introduce like a, a sensitive column, and you don't go and look at your JSON, and all of a sudden it's been exposed to everyone. So this is probably a flaw, and this shouldn't be in here. We should be more explicit. But, um, and then this is a kind of a custom thing that we did. And so we just say, hey, if you've passed in, and this doesn't, this is completely custom, not from Rails. We say, if you pass in this summary, then that's telling us that we want, we're showing this on a summary page of some kind that's not a regular page. So we're going to include some other kind of method on there that has some more information that's specific to that view. So this is messy, and there are better ways to do it. And the other problem is that uh, 
And then this is a problem that will bite you if you use if you override as JSON too often, is that this options include here. Um, so say for example that user had also overridden as JSON, this won't call it when you do it through here. And so you you get confusing kind of unpredictable results based on how you invoke it. Right, so if we had set options methods and we put user, then it would have went and it would have ran the user method, it would have returned the full uh, active record user object that would be in there. And then when 2JSON goes through to serialize everything, it would notice that there's an object and not a hash or whatever, and it would call it as JSON. But when you use this includes, which is what the Rails spec says to do, it just goes and gets the attributes from that. And so this can be kind of unexpected behavior that can be difficult to track down, like, why are my user special fields not in there? Why is it returning everything? Or why is it returning nothing? And so um, a better way to do this is a gem called jbuilder. So this, like, basically the problem with this, as I see it, is, and particularly with this part right here, is we are passing information about the particular view of this particular object down into the object. And so it needs to have a bunch of logic about, well, what does that view need? And then we're telling it to include that information, and then it's passing it back up. And really, that's like either view or controller code or not model code. And so once you get to this level where you start to need these complex object graphs and you need something that's more than just and you know, Rails, their dot two JSON stuff is really helpful and nice and easy for getting off the ground. And like I said, the scaffold controller over here, right? Uh, by default, this is a fully featured controller. It does everything that you know something like Parse or uh, Firebase or whatever online would do. You know, you have all of your CRUD stuff. It even has like this fancy logic for testing if it's saved or not, and your create and returning yes or no, and then it renders everything as JSON. And the whole thing appears to work like magic if you just run it out of the box and you think, wow, this is awesome and easy. And then the first time you need to add something, you go over and ask Jason, and it's awesome and easy, and then your application grows to a certain size, and you're like, man, I wish I had installed JBuilder from the very beginning. <laughs> so JBuilder is uh, the solution to this. So it's basically kind of a, it's like a Ruby DSL for generating uh, JSON. And so this, this is from Thespody right here. Uh, we have, um, a whole bunch of information about beer festivals. There's vendors at them, there's locations at them, there's events before and after the big event, there's events during it, there's special tap times, there's beer styles, there's items that are only associated with event vendors, which is starting to get a pretty complicated, like there's not all vendors, are at all events, and so there's all kinds of different complicated logic in here. We even have a JSON partial for contactable, which is a super polymorphic, anything can have phone numbers type of thing. And so this helps to put this logic where it's supposed to be, which is really close to the thing that needs it, right? It's not in the model, it's not close to the database, it's closer to the thing that needs it. And so this type of DSL is the thing that you're gonna wanna use. Um, and there's another, there's some, there's some other advantages to this too that I think are coming later. But being able to break this up in partials is, is a good way to do it. And so then, you know, for example, if we wanted not the event regular JSON here, which is, you know, could be in events slash events, this is in export. So this is a specific, uh, different representation of a event here that we made specifically for exporting basically the entire uh, JSON block. And so that makes it so we don't have to mess with the as JSON, and you can have multiple different versions of the different representations. It's basically like a view. I mean, it is a view that's just written in JSON. Um, and so this is definitely something, and it's called JBuilder. It's super easy to install. If it's not even a default, you just say gem JBuilder. Probably should we put a version on that. But that's all you need to do. And then the one other thing I wanted to touch on um, about JSON is uh, some other secret parameters. I guess they're not really secret, but uh, these are some other things that can bite you. Um, because Rails likes Rails is, uh, as we all know, opinionated about how things should work. And this is the thing that they've, I think they've switched back and forth a bunch of times, but this is a controversial switch, the include root in JSON. 
So basically, it's do you want your JSON when you say render beers to look like this, which is like the spotted cow. <laughs> or do you want it to be like this? And this is what include root in JSON is. I think this used to be the default, and then they turned it off, and then they turned it back on, and then they made a switch. And then, uh, but it, it totally can mess with your backbone models, for example, is a thing that it can mess with right out of the box if you don't turn it off. I think it's off in Rails 4. I think it's off now. It was on in Rails 2, and then it was off in Rails three, I think, and, but anyway, it's something that you should check on if you care about it, and you should care about it because it's also a thing that needs to be consistent across your app, and this is good because it makes it easy to be consistent. Um, but another gotcha is when you're writing your JBuilder, um, like notice there's no root here, right? This is it, and so this just comes back. Since I don't have this whole thing surrounded by, you know, json.event, do whatever. Like this would be the way to include the root in this thing. And so um, I didn't really talk very much about this DSL, but these are just arbitrary. This is kind of like a method missing thing, where you just say JSON dot whatever, and then it makes the key. And if you pass it, you can pass in an array and say do, so that you can consolidate the the array. Like this is identical to JSON dot locations do, and then locations dot each do. Like these are identical. They just knew that this was an extremely common thing that we would want to do, so they wrote it into DSL here. Um, Brian? Yeah. Is this inspired by the builder for XML? Yes. I don't know if it follows exactly the DSL, but I guess it was, it's inspired by the builder for XML, which is we'll talk about also in a second. I don't want to completely bad mouth XML, because there is use for XML. So. Um, yeah, and then extract basically extracts these. So we're extracting the ID, name, description, location ID from the vendor object. And that just puts it right on whatever uh, vendors. So this will be an array, and then it just puts it right in there. So none of these things have roots in them in the Rails way of putting roots, which is what we wanted. Um, so yeah, wrap parameters.rb. This is in, uh, this is generated by default now. It's in like config slash initializers. It's the thing you should look at and make sure that you know uh, what it's doing. This is an interesting thing too here, this wrap parameters. Uh, it's a weird setting that will make it so that you can reference parameters that aren't there. So if you're posting to, like if someone posts uh, just a JSON document into like beer slash create, that traditionally comes through as just the parameters, you know, I, like ID, name, description, whatever, would just come through as top level parameters. Um, but this wrap parameters uh, setting says that you want to wrap that in whatever the resource is that the, that the controller is associated with. So it'll actually come in and you can say params uh, bracket beer, and then it will get the regular top level ones. And that just makes it uh, it makes it easier for your API to accept both, because if you always reference them as with the wrapped parameter there, then if someone passes it in with the wrapped parameter, then it's there. If someone passes it in just a blank document, then Rails will wrap it for you. And so then you can always just refer to it as like params beer, and then get your attributes out of it, and then you can kind of accept both. Um, I have mixed feelings about that. Um, it's kind of nice for being you know, they say, you know, be generous in what you accept and be, I don't know, whatever, like, strict about what you emit. And so, you know, like, you should emit well-formed, valid everything, but you should accept invalid whatever garbage people post to you to try to be a good citizen. And so it kind of goes down that line, but on the other hand, I kind of don't like the sloppiness of having to get magically coerce non-existent parameters because it can be confusing in debugging, you know, when you say, oh, I'm looking at Prams beer, but I'm looking at you know like a stack dump from my logger, and the parameter isn't there. So like, how did it get there? How does this ever work? Why does this thing work? I don't even understand. It shouldn't even work at all. And then it's like, oh yeah, there's this esoteric config flag that makes up parameter names for you. But I can see the usefulness, but something that I just wanted to point out because uh, again, it's something that can bite you. Uh, 
uh, when you're doing JSON. So, um, that's it, Jason. Any other any questions or anything about JSON? I have a slide about questions at the end, but feel free to interrupt me as we go with this kind of stream of consciousness type of thing. All right, I warned you. So XML, CSV. These are also formats that we use in FestBuddy. Uh, XML, the original app was built on XML. This is the XML builder that you were talking about. Um, like I said, really similar, almost identical DSL to the JSON uh, J builder thing. Um, I wonder actually if it would be possible to like genericize this into just like a question mark builder because the DSLs are so similar, um, especially uh, like I'm not sure if the old, I don't think the old XML builder supports that fancy combined array syntax, but everything else is really similar. And so you might be able to do something really cool if you wanted your JSON and XML to be identical, but I don't think you probably ever do because if someone's requesting XML, they probably have a special reason to do it. And so they like to, those XML people like to have things like this, right? The ID as an attribute rather than as a text field inside. Some of these XML things that parse XML expect things to be in certain places, and so using XML X builder or XML builder kind of lets you handle the same thing. Uh, and so we do for FestBuddy, we do export to XML. We have there's an even uglier file that I don't think I'm up to date on that exports to an XML version that can be consumed by InDesign for printing programs and things, and that XML is hideous for like a mail merge type of thing, for producing things, and so. But the cool part is that we didn't have to write any controller code for that. And we have it set off a file somewhere that's called this is stupid 2013.xml.builder, and then you never have to touch it again, but it still gives your API the power to be extremely versatile if you need to without mucking up the rest of your code. Like it's a thing that nobody has to look at, it's not referenced in the model, it's not even referenced in the controller. We just have a different URL to it. You didn't want to use that to access LP. Let's <laughs> <laughs> not let's stop this discussion before we go to access LP. I also like that you referred to those XML people. Yeah, well, they exist, best. you know. Yeah. Them. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I, I was one for a long time. I spent a long time writing XSLT mm -hmm. instead of enterprise. So. Brian, <clears throat> where do you usually put the builder or the J builder file? Uh, so these go right where you would expect them to in. They go right in the views. Right, so here's my views. I don't know if you can see this. I don't know if I can blow that up. But there's just a whole bunch of JBuilder files here. Uh, the ones with underscores uh, are following that pattern because they're meant to be partials. And you know, so they're referenced, right? Like we just say partial contact, and then other things refer to contact slash contact. Uh, this export one has a whole bunch of different JBuilder files. Um, Here's one that we use for a specific view that's not part of the API. Uh, but yeah, they just go in the regular views next to your handle files, next to whatever, because Rails treats them as just regular views. And then the way you get it to use that, and this is cool, is like this. So now it will go and look for your JBuilder view called index.json.jbuilder by default if you're responding to uh, format JSON. So it's one of the first things I do if I generate these controllers anymore, which a lot of times I don't. But if I do, go through and get rid of those things because you don't want to use as JSON. All right. I don't have time. Talk to them. So, an API for beer? <laughs> How exciting. So this is our this is what we're doing. Uh, we're we're doing great taste uh, that's coming up in a couple weeks. We did it last year. We're doing Quibi's Grove Beer Fest, and we did the Milwaukee World of Beer. And so these guys, they all have um, basically the idea is we have a management interface that they can enter the beers and everything into. Although we end up doing a lot of that, unfortunately. And then there's an iPhone and an Android app, and then the management app. And then we also have a responsive web app that we can send out to like vendors and things where they can edit things, which is more of a, just a, a 
a real vanilla kind of Rails one page form type of layout. Um, but supporting all these four different things uh, led to a number of interesting problems, um, particularly because the apps were written not at the same time, not by the same person. Uh, they originally consumed XML, at least on Android, and then I think we had a manual process that was written in Python that converted XML into JSON because that's what the guy who wrote the iPhone app wanted to consume. And so it was, it was a big project to kind of get all these things and the management interface kind of all speaking the same language. Um, and we learned a number of things. So one of the specific things that we learned, so we, we made a calculated decision at the beginning to make this API for the mobile apps uh, not chatty. We didn't want to be going back and forth and saying, give me beer number one, give me the list of beers, filter the beers for me, what events are happening right now, what's the details for that specific event. We didn't want to do that because um, at, at something like the Great Taste where there's 6,000 plus people all in basically two, if you're lucky, cell towers, your cell coverage on your phone is garbage, basically, and can't be trusted, and is unreliable, and the worst thing that you can happen is have your event, have your app, which is basically a one-day use app, perform horribly on that day, right? That is like the worst thing that you can have. And so we were really sensitive about using network stuff. We didn't want to do anything. Um, we actually even pre-package um, an outdated version of all of this data dump into the App Store builds. And so like worst case scenario, if you've never launched the app and you can never download an update, you'll have data from whenever we submitted it. Um, but we ran into the problem that uh, <clears throat> generating that giant JSON thing takes a long time. I mean, the Great Taste has uh, like hundreds of beers. There's like 100 and something, 150 individual vendors. There's all kinds of stuff going on. And I think the thing, uh, last year was weighed in at over 200k which isn't huge obviously but like that's a lot of JSON and so we ran in right away to or this is hosted on Heroku and so we ran right away into uh, one of Heroku's fundamental limitations which is it's bad at concurrency if unless you pay them a lot of money so it's fast and it's scalable and it's good and it's awesome it's easy to deploy and I Heroku forked something the other day and it was amazing and but when you have something, someone on a phone downloading 250K of JSON, even if it's generated immediately because their CPUs are fast, if that takes five seconds to transfer over their slow cell connection, that's blocking that dyno for all five seconds. And so we switched to Unicorn, which supports concurrency, but not very well. It's three or four different uh, simultaneous connections. Uh, Unicorn is a different web server that you can run that's better than or different than like Thin or Webrick, which is something that you wouldn't want to run in production anyway. Uh, but using Heroku, yeah, using Heroku. So you just specify what you want, what you want them to do. Like you just change the jam around, and then I think there's a there's like a rack up file, like a .ru file that you check in, and then Heroku reads all of your configuration for rack there because they, I think their whole whole support is based on rack and not Rails because they support so much stuff for Ruby now anyway. Like you can deploy Sinatra apps and things like that, and they don't care. And so you can set your server in there, and you just say, you know, form and start, whatever, and, and your rack up, and then they they handle that. And it, it's pretty straightforward to do, and it's pretty well documented. Yeah. So independent of the, the data that you're sending down the line, you can generally get or get away with, depending on the size of your uh, Rails application, three to four different unicorn processes running within one Heroku dyno. After that, you start running into diminishing returns where it's swapping and you don't want that. But in your unicorn.rb file, you said work processes to two, two, three, or four. Yeah, we ended up going with four on this, and we didn't have a problem. And I think at most, we had two dynos, and it, it handled everything fine. It really kind of depends on your slug size. Yeah. Just kind of gauge it based on, based on that. And then, so what we did, though, to, to completely mitigate that problem is, so this 250K, giant blob of JSON is something that doesn't change very often, right? It only changes when someone goes in there and edits a description or adds a new beer or changes a special tap time release. So it's a great candidate for caching aggressively. And so we did. We used, um, I'm going to show some more code here. 
Go ahead. Is it completely stateless? Um, what do you mean? The request is? Yeah. Did, yeah. You, did you think about putting it behind the CDN? Uh, we don't have that much traffic. So it turns out memcache worked perfect for us. So we just put this magic line in here. You say cache as action entire event. And then this thing and that giant thing of JSON just executes it once. And then we switch. There's a wonderful gem um, let's see, uh, called Dolly, I think. And Heroku makes it super easy. They have a, a free tier of memcache that you can install for free, and it's, it's you get like five megs or something, which is plenty, because we only need 250K. And then I think they don't even count that against your bandwidth or whatever if it's served from memcache. And so it was like a no-brainer to use that, because it generates the thing once, and then it sticks it in memcache, and then everything just pulls from it, and it's like lightning fast, and we don't need to worry about concurrency, and we don't need to worry about anything, because it all handles it. And so yeah, CDN would be a great use for something like this, or something like CloudFront would be a great use for something like this. Um, we don't need, we didn't need that much. I mean, like I said, at, at worst we have six thousand people asking for it at the same yeah. time, which in the world of concurrency is like orders of magnitude smaller than you need to really worry about. But it is large enough that you need to not be real dumb about it. Yeah, that's just so stupidly cheap. So it's something like CloudFront. Right. <laughs> so how do you bust that cash? Uh, good question. So. Rails has a cool thing called cache sweepers, which is a built into their whole action controller thing. So basically, over here, um, so this one actually isn't swept because it doesn't matter because this thing never changes anything. So you add the sweeper to anything that changes anything, and then we say, I want to observe the following objects from this cache sweeper event location, event vendor, and vendor. And there probably needs to be some other things. This is probably behind. Probably need beers and styles and some other things here. But then basically, I wrote this beast of a function to kind of figure out what is the thing that changed, drill up to find the root event that is associated with that thing, <coughs> or more than one thing would potentially be, and then go through and then basically, and this took some figuring out. You need all of these things. And basically, it's the same. It's all the parameters that you need to route is what the cache key uh, by default in Rails is based on. And so then you say expire action, and then you basically pass it a route, right? Controller export action entire event with the event ID, and you even need the format on there because otherwise it, it won't find it. And then basically that just expires it. And then uh, this is like an alias thing. We have like a an alias, so you don't need to use the ID. So this expires the same cache if you referenced it by like our, our fancy friendly ID or whatever. <clears throat> and then furthermore, we update a column on there called data version so that the apps don't need to pull the server all the time and, and download the data. They can say, hey, what's the latest version of the data for this event? And then if it's version 215 and I have version 215, I'm not going to go pull down the JSON again because I know that I'm up to date. If it's version 220, then I'd better go and download the whole thing. And then hopefully it'll be cached by then. And if it's not, then the first person will take a long time. Anybody after that. So, and the way you invoke that, let's see if we can find another controller here. Probably this guy. So you just say cache sweeper and then the name of your sweeper. And then that tells that sweeper to observe all of the objects that it observes for any of the, whenever any of the actions on this controller are called. And so it makes it pretty straightforward with some messing and a lot of testing and things like that to make sure that everything is getting expired properly. But what do they say? Variable naming and cache expiration, two hard problems in computer science. So yeah, so after that, uh, we scaled it back to the Heroku free version, and uh, except for the post, except for the database, uh, we haven't ever worried about it anymore because Memcache just handles everything and is just totally an issue. Um, and then uh, another quick, so after we did Milwaukee, uh, we thought, hey, okay, cool, it was a huge success. Everybody liked it. They loved the app. Like more than half the people that were at the event downloaded the app, which is. It's like 52% of people or something. 
And so we're like, yeah, we're giving each other high fives and we're drinking beer and we're thinking everything is awesome. And then we forge in ahead for development for the next one. And as we do that, we break the API. We make some changes, we add some columns, I change something that used to just be uh, just an object, now we're turned an array. Like now you're allowed to have multiple contacts instead of just one or something like that. And uh, we get a complaint uh, from the Milwaukee guys, this is three or four weeks after the event, and they say, hey, somebody on Facebook was going back and looking at the app and checking out you know, what, they, what their favorites were, and they wanted to go to the store and buy them, and then the app is just crashing. And we're like, oh man, okay. It was coded poorly, and so it doesn't gracefully handle things like, and it probably shouldn't be expected to, to handle getting an array when you're expecting it to be an object. It's like, that's probably not really a thing you need to handle in your code. It probably should crash, and it did it. And so now we're like, well, what do we do? That was three weeks ago. Um, we don't, that stuff is gone. Like, we can go look it up in Git, but it's gone. So I thought, well, let's do that. Let's go look it up in Git. Let's roll back the code base to what we had on production. Uh, Heroku fork to a dev thing, where Heroku just clones everything, including the database to a separate server. And then I pushed uh, the old commit ref up to the branch Heroku, and then re-ran this JSON file, or this JSON export, and then I just saved it to public. Public slash controller slash, public slash export slash 123.json, or whatever, whatever it was. And it turns out Rails will happily serve that long before it gets to your controller if you just stick it there. So this has kind of been our, our way of not breaking backwards compatibility. So. This is not a replacement for version APIs, by the way. This was a hack <laughs> that we put in after the fact when we needed to solve a specific one-time problem. And so hopefully in the future, uh, this will be solved by uh, versioning. Okay, so this is, this is how easy it was to get, um, by the way, to get a Mancache set up on Heroku. Right. Pretty straightforward. And it totally worked. Like, I was blown away. It was the easiest thing I've ever done. So versioning, uh, this is really an important thing that is often hard to think about on version one of something that you will need to remember what version one looked like of something by, like you don't really realize that, and start thinking about that until you have version two and then people will still on version one start complaining that it's broken. So obviously bad is just breaking things, which is what we did. Um, we managed to fix it using a hack, and I'm actually okay with that hack for archival purposes anyway. Like, I think it's kind of a neat way to archive, like, hey, if anybody uses this thing, we're snapshotting all of the data at whatever it was, so if they change their description or they change the names of the beers after the fact, we're keeping it for historical purposes. But that's more of a data archive thing, not an API structure method. So what we're probably going to do, uh, if we need to do this, next is is the okay solution because this is more of a side project and we don't have a lot of time or this is bad. Um, and just use different JBoard reviews, right? Have someone pass in maybe a version number as a query parameter or something like that and then you could just render different JSON JBoard reviews or whatever, which kind of leads into the proper way, which is different JBoard reviews with different controllers probably in modules. And so you can do things um, and this is, this is more of the thing that you should be worried about. Um, like it might be overkill for something that's just feeding an iPhone app that you wrote and an Android app. But something like this where you say, we're going way, way from, we're not even exposing the regular object controllers. We're saying this is our specific, this is going to be our public API. We're going to have a whole module called API and then a sub-module called V1. And then we're going to have Beers controller under there. This controller probably doesn't do any updating, or in our case, and, or creating, or maybe it does updating and creating, but not destroying, or maybe it handles things differently, uh, things that you would only want to do, you know, not through an admin panel, probably, for example, wouldn't use something like this. And then, the advantage of this is that you can handle all of the versioning through your routes. And so you just publish a different you just publish a different route. You say slash v1 slash beers dot json, and then that's the v1. And if you say slash v2, it goes and invokes a completely different stack of code, different controllers, uh, different JBoard reviews, uh, still the same data underneath, which is obviously important. But this is this is I think the proper way 
to keep these things separate and versioned, and then they can live forever. And um, and you can you can even add things to them, right? Like the problem is you don't want to remove things or change things. But if you add fields, usually that's not a problem to add things to your API or things like that. But don't remove anything. Don't replace anything that used to be an object with an array. Don't turn stuff null. Don't rename fields. Things like that. And if you do need to do those things, uh, do them all at once and rev your version and call it v2 now and then stop changing it after that. And then while I have this up, uh, my next slide is about, um, <clears throat> I think the last thing that I want to talk about, uh, which is authentication for your API. So in our situation for this, uh, we don't have any authentication. It's a iPhone app that's free. Uh, you don't log in. We don't care if someone really, if, if we can put an API key on it, but if someone really wants the data, they can just go and get it. Um, and so this is something that we'll probably want to be adding in the future, but basically if, if the data can come down to your iPhone or your Android, if someone wanted to get a hold of it, they would be able to get a hold of it. And so trying to secure against, secure your public data doesn't really make sense to us at the time. Um, but in general, it is something that you would want to do. And so. There's a couple ways to do this. Um, this, the, the things we're looking at here are more for like API token based stuff, which I'm sure that everybody has used when you need to put your Twitter token in order to talk to their API or whatever. They're probably doing something like this. And so <clears throat> a couple common ways is you either pass it in as a parameter every time, which I don't really like because it's ugly and you have to remember to do it everywhere. Um, you can pass it in as an HTTP header which is my preferred way to do it because oftentimes there are ways to just put that into whatever is controlling. Hopefully you have a thing controlling all of your network requests and you can just have it add that to every single request. And then it's kind of out of band. It doesn't get shuffled up and mixed in with things that are data and it's because it's not really data. Um, on a similar point, HTTP uh, basic authentication is another out of band thing handled through an HTTP header. Um, doesn't seem particularly more secure or less secure to me than an access token. Um, probably less secure because these things just seem easier to expire and replace than having a password and a username or something. But um, you could also tie these tokens to user accounts or whatever and have them privileged and do all kinds of things. Um, and then an important thing to remember with that is if you're going to put authentication, like basic authentication or um, token authentication, things like that, uh, you should be using HTTPS because otherwise anyone can just get your password. It is right there. HTTP authentication is not encrypted. It uses Base64. It is reversible. And so if you're not transmitting that over HTTPS, anybody even close to your network can just take your API token and then it's like, why even have an API token if you're just going to give it away to anyone? So. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and then, like I said, remember, this is a thing you have to pass in on every request because we don't do sessions over APIs. So you may have a login, like some APIs require you to log in. I don't really like that, but usually what they do after you log in is they pass you back some sort of token that you continue to pass to the server back and forth. And then that token can be transient or ephemeral, and you can expire it after a couple hours and force people to re-authenticate and things like that. But at the end of the day, the server isn't really remembering that you're logged in in a traditional cookie or session-based type of thing. You're passing in your authentication with every request. And so it is important to use HTTPS if you're doing that. So I think that's about all I had. And I'm actually doing pretty good on time here. So questions, comments? Thirsty? Can you, uh, can you tell us how? You found out that the Dali gem was working. What? What was? You just? I tested it. So Memcache is easy to install. Memcache D. You're on my Mac. It's like a uh, a brew command away. You tested locally. Yeah. I didn't want to have to deploy to Heroku to test all this stuff. It logs the hits to Memcache and Heroku too, like in the Heroku logs. Yeah. No. Yeah. It definitely does. And so you can see that it's working um, for sure. But we wanted to make sure that it was working locally. Um, the reason that I wanted to test it locally too was we had problems discovering what the cache keys were. Like, 
it, it took me a long time to realize that I needed to include that format JSON on the end of it because it treats that as part of the routing and so it puts it into the cache key. And so we were just trying to expire, you know, event slash one, two, three, and it was like, okay, we're expiring it, but then it wouldn't it would still return the same stuff, even though I had known that I had changed it. And so there was a lot of debugging going on in making sure that the cache sweeper worked and that it was expiring the cache properly when it needed to, and that it was also expiring the proper cache was a problem that I spent way too much time on. So I did install it locally. Um, you don't have to, it does log things. And uh, yeah, like it will say cache hit, and then it will give you like some cool milliseconds or whatever, like one millisecond worth of time. So it makes you feel cool. So how many clients total are there? Are there three? Yeah, so Great Taste will be our, I think, third or fourth festival. We did them last year. Okay. So, yeah. But we're I, I mean, like, uh, so you have iOS, Android. Oh, so four, yeah. So I didn't talk at all about the management interface. So the management interface is a rich JavaScript single page app written with Cinch's uh, EXTJS, which is a tool that I can't stop using because mm -hmm. it's so great. Um, but it is really chatty, right? It is the opposite. It doesn't download a bunch of things. It updates things live, and it checks for conflicts, and it has big grids and big tables and things like that. And so, but it operates entirely over the JSON API because it's just a single web page. And okay. then we have a regular, um, like it's like a day of built for mobile kind of checklist thing that uh, either the vendors themselves or us on site can go through and say, okay, let's make sure that you have what you said you did and mm -hmm. make sure that you know we can fix typos on it. And then that just uses like a regular, um, that's actually a backbone, just a quick little okay. backbone, one page, one form kind of uh, interface that was built for mobile. And so, mobile follow up question. Yes. Did you find you had to compromise the code like any, like any, in any non-view capacity to, to serve one of those masters, or were you able to completely firewall controllers from all of those different clients? Uh, only, only because of Pete did we have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so let me see if I can find this in here. Um, this might not, I think this is in here. <laughs> I had to do this because Pete was expecting this to come. He didn't parse the dates, he just looked at the numbers, and so all the times were wrong. So once we put it into the database, Rails turns them into GMT, right? And then we send them back out as GMT, because it turns out it's actually the same. And your date library should parse it and show it to the person in a time zone that they're in, because dates are absolute and they are real, and time zones exist, even though a lot of developers don't like to believe that time zones exist, they do and they are real. So we had to put this hack in for, uh, for the iPhone code because it was saying things were at noon when they were really at 8 p.m. or whatever. And so oh. we had to convert everything into central time just for this one rev. Who is this big guy you talk about? <laughs> he's awesome, actually. He's a, really, he's a really good guy, and this is just kind of an oversight. <laughs> and it's one of those things that's fun about mobile development because you can't just fix it, right? Like, it's in the App Store. It's been downloaded, and people have it on their phones. You can't just fix it. So, <laughs> but I can fix it on the server. But yeah, in general, I, we didn't really have any, any huge problems like that. Like uh, using JSON, everything can parse JSON, and all the data was there, and it was pretty straightforward. And, you know, what, they, what the clients did with the data um, didn't matter. Like the iPhone app, it, it converted everything into core data records and cached it like that, and then used lookups and everything. Uh, through that, in Android, it, it like parsed it in memory, I think, without or parsed it in just like ephemeral objects and just kept it stored in JSON and then parsed it every time it booted. Mm. And so, uh, but it didn't matter to me because all we did was pass the thing down and then forget about it. What did you use to convert from JSON to core data? I didn't write it, so I don't know. I think it was custom. I don't think it was easy because it had a lot of bugs, like it crashed on. <laughs> Time's up, it's been or whatever, so. Brent, can you show the management application just briefly so we can see what it is? Sure. Um,
So there's a bunch of beers. There's some descriptions. These are the guys who are showing up. This is the ones that we've confirmed. So there's just a ton of data in here. So this is Sencha uh, EXTJS, kind of their default look and feel for things, which is pretty ugly, but um, their grid controls are really good. So you know, like getting you know this kind of stuff for free is really nice. And then like they have this cool grid editor and things like this. And so uh, you know, this is the type of thing if you wanted to do it from scratch it would take a long time. <clears throat> when you don't do it from scratch, you just want to act slightly different. It ends up taking a long time anyway, but it's not the thing to think about when you're starting a project. So. Very nice. All right, anything else? Uh, one thing I'd say is uh, there's an ebook by Steve Plavnik called Designing Hypermedia APIs. Funny enough, it's at designhypermediaapis.com. <laughs> I would highly suggest it. And this is by Steve Kleidman. Yeah. He's a good guy. And he's speaking at Madison Ruby. And he is speaking at Madison Ruby. I don't know. About why he's this? Is he really? I believe he is. Cool. Fun. What a good conference that's going to be. All right, anything else? Questions, so, comments? One other plug, if you don't want to worry about any of this, I wrote an engine for Rails called API Engine that basically just exposes all your models as a bulk API that fits Ember data exactly. So if you really just like don't want to think about it. There's totally a secure. Right? There's no authentication, so. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually a hook for it that is in a branch. So if somebody wants to go look at it and figure out how to do it, like it, it could be, authentication could be added pretty easily. So. Um, it's pretty simple, but if you're, especially if you're building an Ember app and you just want all the bulk data ops to work like correctly, so you don't have to update one thing at a time, it just all works. Cool. All right. All right. We're good. Great. Thank you. Thank you.